are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm the host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be diving deep. Dr. Robert G. Hoyland is joining me today, and we're going to talk about sources that were not uh, that are not from Islam or Muslims. Th- th- these are sources as others saw the early stages of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. So we're going to be discussing that and maybe briefly uh, the other book, which I'd like to take a deeper dive on in God's path. And I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, please, you're going to want to go get the books. These books are fantastic, especially if you want to understand what, what does both sides of the coin say? You know, you never want to just take the word for one side. You always want to investigate, look at the other side, just to hear what they have to say. They could be wrong. You never know. Uh, In God's Path is on Audible. I listened to the whole book, Driving to Texas, and uh, highly recommend listening to that if you want to get a familiarity with the period at a hand. I mean, like literally the whole period. And it was, uh, let's just be honest, a bloodbath. I mean, everybody was at everybody's throats for power and control, but it's really interesting watching how that happened. Also, Arabia and the Arabs. I, (laughs) I got this book on Amazon, and... I thought I bought it, but I rented it. Then I get this email saying, are you ready to return your book? No, I'm not returning this book. I thought I bought it. I had to buy it again. So welcome to Myth Vision Podcast, Dr. Hoyland. I really appreciate you taking your time out to join us. It's great to speak to you, Derek. Thank you. Uh, If I may, especially since you're new to the channel, let me give a a short uh, introduction to who you are and why you matter in this in this particular subject. So Dr. Hoyland is a scholar and historian specializing in medieval history of the Middle East. He's a former student of historian Patricia Crone, and I wish she was still with us because I would love to interview her and was a I'm not sure if I pronounce this right. Leverholm fellow at Pembroke College. Yeah, Leverholm. Yeah. Lever yeah, Awesome. At uh, Pembroke College, Oxford. He is currently professor at Late Antique and Early Islamic Middle Eastern History at New York University's Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. Are you currently still the professor? Yeah, yeah that's my job. Yeah. Awesome. It's nice Happy. place to be. <laughs> right by Central Park in the Metropolitan Museum. So, yeah. Excellent. Having previously been professor of Islamic history at the University of Oxford facility of Oriental Studies and a professor of history at the University of St. Andrews and UCLA, he has many books, many books. I highly recommend go to Amazon down in the description. You can go there yourself if you want. Just type in his name, Robert G. Hoyland. You'll find a lot of books on the subject matter that you want to look into here on early Islamic uh, traditions. And, um, there's a real, real, how do I put this? What's, what's really piqued my interest is that you have a tradition and then you have other sources that don't line up with this tradition. So let's start off basic, if I may. What made you interested in getting into any of this at all, right? We're Westerners. Why are we, why are we interested in Middle Eastern studies of Islam and Muhammad, the whole nine? So I could go a few directions with that because I did have, as you mentioned, a very inspiring teacher, Patricia Croner, who, um, yeah, she was an amazing woman, really, really inspirational. So I, I did want to study with her. And she and her, her colleague, Michael Cook, wrote this fascinating book, Hagarism, an alternative vision of Islamic history. And it is fascinating. You, you're kind of led into this different world, which is really very different from what you're told from the Muslim sources. So I did want to find, look into that further. That, is this real? Is this true? You know, can we verify any of this? So that was definitely one exciting bit, the kind of puzzle-like dimension to this question. Uh, but it is also in terms of history, it's an amazing period of transformation. You've had for about 1100 years, you had the Roman Empire, you know, the Greek Romans, and then the Persians on the other side. And it's amazing, really, 1100 years of history is a long time. And yet it gets swept away by the Arab conquests. So the Persian Empire just disappears and the Roman Empire loses all its Near Eastern Mediterranean provinces. So it is an amazing period of transformation. And you move forward about a century and you've got a very different sort of world. You know, you see Baghdad, this great capital pop up and it's the center of a new empire that goes from Morocco to Afghanistan. It's a hell of a journey even nowadays, <laughs> let alone yeah. for people just mar- marching across it. So that double kind of whammy, if you like, was what 
propelled me on this study. Wow. Yeah. For me, it's the interest of uh, Abrahamic faiths. For me in particular, it was, and, and I'm just relating having this conversation as we're going to probe into more content in your book. For me, it was just getting into um, how the Abrahamic tradition develops and over periods under different circumstances and different cultures. That That's something that really drew my attention. And coming out of uh, the faith, that I was in a more extreme form of it. Uh, it piqued my interest that I didn't really understand a lot of this and there's much more to, to it than what meets the eye. That's what caught my attention and fascinates me. So now I'm looking into Islam and I said, you got to go to the, to the critical scholars and to the, to the experts in the field who are not necessarily pushing an agenda and want you to see things necessarily the way they want you to, but try to be as, as balanced and nuanced as possible. So I have you and uh, I would be, mm interested in getting into some of these questions if that's okay with you yeah excellent all right so we're going to bring up a, a visuals for those who are watching pause the video at the visuals if you want to like spend a little extra time observing the the visuals that i created um these are the actual images of some of these manuscripts that are being mentioned that are sources from non-muslims uh so you're going to hear the other side of the coin on the earliest if we can go to data. Before I do, I need to ask, the material we're going to get into that's non-Muslim sources, does this material date far earlier than the earliest copies of Islamic material that we have that's trying to um, paint the history of from Muhammad and right after the Prophet, etc.? So like, I guess the best way I'm putting it is if we had non-Christian sources trying to account about Jesus – um, and then we had Christian sources, let's say, date to the late second century. The earliest we have is late second century, but we found, let's say, late first century uh, non Christian sources. Is that kind of a picture that's being painted here for non Muslim sources and Muslim sources? Yeah, there's always a slight mismatch here between. So, one of the, some of the sources we're looking at, they definitely, the, the author existed at a very early time, you know, some of them from only a couple of years after Muhammad. But the actual manuscripts, of course, what tends to happen is, so he might write something or she, that gets copied and copied, and so we might only have relatively late. It always surprises people to know that when they think they're reading Aristotle, they're reading copies of copies, and sometimes it's like a lot of the copies of Aristotle are from 12, 1300 AD. Wow, 1700 years after he's, you know, like after he's alive. So. You, it could be, of course, that copyists make mistakes, introduce typos, things like that. So there is that slight discrepancy. But yeah, the actual authors that we're talking about are certainly from very early, just from the time of Muhammad and a few years later. Whereas the Muslim sources we have, the authors are only from the ninth century at the earliest. But some of the manuscripts we have are very early. The earliest one we have is from the 820s. So, but it is still 200 years after Muhammad. So. Right, right. So definitely the non-Muslim sources are allowing us to dive down and get nearer. But obviously you can't then get into the fallacy that all early sources are true and all late sources are false. That definitely right. isn't the case. And you also talk about a perspective. So we do actually have early non-Christian sources about Jesus. But, you know, the pagan Roman authors but for them he's just god this guy's talking about stuff that seems a bit weird and wonderful and you know, he's yeah. causing a lot of problems making people rebel against the government and things so you know he's a troublemaker for heaven's sake you know so there's a hell of a difference in perspective you know and, and people, you can say which is right or wrong but that is difficult you sometimes have to accept that there are different perspectives on the same event. Anybody who works in car insurance kind of knows that when you get two people saying what happened in a car accident, <laughs> you might think, wow, <laughs> they were in different crashes. Yeah, that is a great point. Perspective, I think, is going to be the subjective tool for everybody at this point, because it's the same problem I have when I, I did a series on Joseph Smith, for example, just to get, because mm. I love getting into figures in history that and everyone goes, he's a con man. You know, people who don't, that aren't Mormons, that don't believe he's a con man, right? That's how they, they view him. Um, the other side says he was the prophet. And so when you get into this study, I, I don't know, I start to empathize. I start to read and go, 
I don't think he was like, I think he believed in his own stuff. So whether you think he was um, dishonest or whatever, I think he really believed in his stuff. So um, getting into it and trying to weigh out the evidence, like you got to put on the shoes. It's hard mm. in the 21st century for us to imagine what life was like and how they would view the world around them in those times. So there's so many things I ask our audience to consider when you look into these. Don't just be a critic and ah, not like try. Mm. Try to understand Yes, we don't want to repeat some of these things in history, but try to understand this is history. So, uh, Dr. Hoyland, if I may, let's go to the first example. And the first example I have right here is a fragment of the Arab conquest. This fragment dates to 636 AD. Um, according to, and I'm just going to read this up, Professor, can you tell us about the fragment of the Arab conquest manuscript? What language is it written? Who wrote it? What's written on it, etc. This manuscript is written in 636 AD, and in Muslim sources, Muhammad, the prophet, died in 632 AD. Is there some mistake made somewhere? Um, as if we go by these dates, then it seems as if Muhammad was alive. So is there any way you can elaborate on that for, any, for me? Yeah, I mean, one thing I always tell my students is make sure you get the backstory. <laughs> because you know, it's like a news item. It sounds, oh, that's crazy, isn't it? But then maybe if you read around and try and get the broader context, you, you know, it becomes something quite different. And this text is rather unusual because actually the, the actual manuscript as a whole is a copy of the gospel. And it's, it's very early. It's like late 6th century. But then just on the front page... It's more was like, you know, you sort of buy an old book and it's got like a couple of blank pages either side. So this is like that. It partly just protected um, the ink. You know. But someone who's written this account, it's in Syriac, which is a old Christian language. It's a dialect of Aramaic, which Jesus would have spoken. And in fact, it's really ancient. It goes back a thousand years before. Jesus. So it's at the time in the sixth century, it's one of the main languages of the Middle East. And someone's written this account. 636 AD is, to be honest, a slight guess, but what it describes is a battle between, it says, the Arabs of Muhammad and the Romans, somewhere in the, between uh, in the modern day uh, Golan area, so between Damascus and northern Israel, if you like, somewhere around there. There's a couple of battles it could be. So to be honest, it, this could be anywhere between 634 and 636. So, but it is really early. But it, we can't quite tell what's going on. If you pull it up and show them again, you'll see that it's yeah. actually got little holes in it, little bits and pieces. So it's a little bit tricky to be 100% sure what's going on. But that's 100% sure. It's a battle between the Arabs, Muhammad, and the Romans. It's around 634 to 636 because the Muslims, or the Arabs of Muhammad anyway, are still... I think this little red... In this red circle here is... Um, the name Muhammad, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that occurs twice in that little passage. Interesting. So it, it's. I don't know if you want me to go into what it's used as <laughs> I mean, uh, yet, but the theory that it, modern scholars like to use it for. But anyway, that's the point. It's just, but it's just a note. It's not that there's a whole book here on the Arab conquest. The main text is all about the the gospel. Just to, somebody's copied it out. Um, and this is just a little note on the front cover or the in inside of the front cover. You could think that maybe you know, someone's in a monastery that's near where the battle happened. And so this guy has written a little note about it. Interesting, because I guess this we're going to be revisiting this question about when Muhammad might be still alive or dead. And that that comes up again as we continue to try and figure out like what we're trying to figure out historically, like what really happened. Right. And it's tough to know from both sources. So our, we'll, we'll jump into another source if that's okay with you, Thomas, the presbyter. And from what I understand, Thomas, the presbyter was written around 640 AD. Can you tell us about the Thomas, the presbyter manuscript? What language is it written in? What is written on it? If this manuscript is written in 640 AD, is there some mistake made somewhere as if we go by these dates, then it seems as if Muhammad is alive. If we take the locations of where these battles happen, and they are clearly outside Saudi Arabia, as according to like 
Muslim biographies, he never left Saudi Arabia. Has there been some mistake made or would you think that some of those um, biographies might be later? So they're kind of trying to do something different uh, as time goes by. I, I, like, uh, Sorry for continuing, but when I talked to Dr. Anthony right, in his book on the historical Muhammad, I love it. I absolutely love it because to me, it's like, all right. We know what a prophet looks like. Just look at the Bible. They're all shepherds. And 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 so mm-hmm. was he a shepherd? Was he a merchant? Well, let's divorce him from being a merchant and let's make him a shepherd. Or maybe there's some mm-hmm. truth to both. And this is what I enjoyed about his book. So the question becomes like, in this case, would there be some reason to kind of not have Muhammad uh, be alive after the time that they make him you know, where they say he died. I I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have. So Mm. you're getting near into what is a a bigger kind of theory now, which I might have to explain a little bit. So viewers can understand what you're talking about here. So first Thomas the Presbyter. So he's an author. We actually know him. He's a monk monastery in Southern Palestine. He's writing a chronicle. Just so the whole text also in Syriac, like the previous fragment, but the whole text is a chronicle of the world going from creation right up until the time he's writing, which is about 640. Um, he, in the later part, he's getting up to you know, events dealing with the rise of Islam. He doesn't know really, I mean, you've got to remember this is just a little guy, a monk down in a small little place in southern Palestine. But he knows there was this battle nearby, it's about 12 miles from east of modern Gaza. Again, it's between the Arabs, Muhammad, and the Romans. The Romans lose. Arabs win. Great victory. Wonderful. But he just notes it down. It's very exact, actually. I think I have looked at these for a long time, but I think something like the ninth hour of the fourth day of February. You know, it's really, really specific. So you get the sense that he does know. He's got first-hand knowledge about it. He doesn't know how to make sense of it. He doesn't go into any big theories. He just, again, it notes down this event, you know, local event. So the Arabs of Muhammad, does, you could take that as a collective name for those who follow the Muhammad the prophet who now is dead or alive. It's a bit vague, Arabs of Muhammad. But let me say one way you could run with it, and this is the way Patricia Croner, my supervisor, ran with it in her book with Michael Cook on Hagarism. The, the Arabs seem to be heading... So they're in Palestine, and they're heading for Jerusalem. So her idea is that Muhammad's original idea was to capture Jerusalem. It wasn't about broad conquests. And the reason for that is because of the apocalyptic worldview. There had just been this 25-year huge battle between the Romans and the Persians. A lot of people dying, huge amounts of battles. It's an apocalyptic kind of seen if you like <laughs> it's a crazy times and jerusalem had been captured by the persians and it gets retaken the romans conquer iran they bring back the holy cross which had been stolen by the persians bring it, the emperor of the romans comes down to jerusalem puts the cross back on mount golgotha you know it's, it's crazy times so is muhammad leading an apocalyptic movement he wants to capture jerusalem so he's there ready in the place where Jesus is going to return for the second coming. So this idea is, and they do it in collaboration with the Jews. So it's a Jewish Muslim kind of joint ideology about the end of the world. And for us, this is a bit difficult to get into, but you have to remember there's a lot of people who, you know, when they're talking about the second coming of Christ, it's not some vague notion. Yeah. It is going to happen, you know, maybe even as soon as our lifetimes. And it's particularly when massive events like this have happened, like a big confrontation between superpowers, that people get very worked up about it. So that's the kind of atmosphere. And it's an interesting idea. There's about another academic, Stephen Schumacher, who you might want to interview on this as well. He wrote a book called Death of the Prophet. And he takes up these references. There's about 11 of them, which all point to the idea of two things. One, Muhammad being alive later than the traditional death date of 632, and two of going outside Arabia into Palestine. The problem is all these references, 
you could, if you want to be very skeptical, say they're not. No, no one just says, "Hey, Mohammed's in Jerusalem," you know, five o'clock, six thirty-four, <laughs> you know, in February. None's that explicit. It's like this: the Arabs, Mohammed, have attack the Romans in six thirty-four. Does that mean he's alive, or are they just known as the Arabs of Mohammed? Right. You know? Sounds vague. So it's not a hundred percent. The idea is fascinating. It's because one of the problems we have more broadly of historians is explaining change. It's easy to describe events in, in a general way, but thinking what's causing these changes that we can see around us. And that's, I mean, it's still not easy today sometimes you know, explaining big events. One of the, one possible driver of quite a few events is apocalypticism. I mean, some people use it to explain Jesus as well. He's fueled by an idea, you know, he says at one point about how we know about the end of time it's going to be these battles and plague and famine and people asking when's it going to happen and he's saying just a little bit now not long now <laughs> you know telling us that it, it's a, a near thing so it, that's a and it's a big motivating factor we still have in our you know in recent times people of small groups cults we always say because we find them a bit odd of people who think that the end of the world is coming and they've all come committed mass suicide because they think, you know, that's the end of the world and, or done various things in the expectation that the world's about to end. So it, it, it can be a, a major motivation. Wow. Yeah. And that, that's what underlies. It's funny, this tiny little account, and a couple a few others are what make up our backing for a, a kind of big theory of what motivates the whole rise of Islam. It's, it's a lot of weight to place on these sources, but it is a fascinating theory. It makes a lot of sense to me uh, from what I've heard. You know, there's, there seems to be some elements that uh, even the Prophet Muhammad would say things like uh, he believed that that uh, it was going to end soon. Very apocalyptic type phrases that they've put in the mouth of, of the Prophet. So, uh, and that's something I'm fascinated with. Apocalypticism is a huge thing of mine, interested in, in Second Temple Judaism, of course, in Christianity. Um, I've been talking to scholars about that endlessly, so I really want to dig at some point deeper into apocalypticism and early Islam and how, you know, it, it seems like it's also still continued. It's still an idea that always will continue till time ends. Uh, but the same thing we see with Christianity. So uh, this goes into possible theories of cognitive dissonance and other such uh, hypotheses that I think are very interesting to dive into. Thank you for commenting on that. We'll get into another one of these. And I love this one right here. I yeah. loved it. This one's so much yeah. fun. <laughs> so the uh, Doctrina yeah. Jacobi, if I could use the term, 10th century Greek text talking about 634 to 640 AD or something like that. Can you tell us about this text? Um, what language you know, is it in? Is it in Greek for sure? Uh, what does it say on the text? And there's a line, just to give you an emphasis, there's a line in the Doctrina uh, Jacobi, if you will, Jacob, that says, And I, Abraham, thoroughly investigating, heard from those who met him, Muhammad, where exactly is this location um, where Muhammad was, if you don't mind me asking. So I don't know if you know that phrase by heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're right. This is, again, another f fascinating text. It's a much more substantial one. Yes, it's in Greek. It, I mean, in many ways, it's a classic Christian text against the Jews. It's a whole genre, Christian writings against Jews. And they normally often stage it in a way that there's a Christian and a Jewish speaker, and they're arguing with each other, and the, the Christian is made to show that Christianity is the true faith and Judaism is wrong. It's, it's a popular form of literature. It's really done for the folks back home, as you would say, here in America. But yeah. it's, it's, not for, it's a home audience showing, hey, look how great we are. We've got the true faith, not, not the Jews. But in this, it has a, a rather fascinating little piece about the this guy, Abraham. And he's heard reports, it says, about, and it says, the prophet um, of the Saracens coming with the Jews. So this seems to confirm this point that there was a collusion between Muhammad and his followers and the Jews. Um, this guy is made to, check, well, as you say, check it out. And he's told that he says, man, the prophet. So I must add at this stage, it says the prophet coming with the uh, prophet of the Saracens. It does not say Muhammad. Ah. 
at this point, I mean, in 634, you could say, who else could it be? But often the problem for us is that we have only a tiny, tiny proportion of the sources written at the time. So we only have a, a small view, a very pinpoint sort of view. And it, it may be that other you know, bigger things are going on. But anyway, that's a, so that's one little problem there. But, but equally, you know, there are lots of reports about Muhammad from these 630s. So it makes sense to think that this must be who is intended. If it is the prophet, if it is Muhammad, let's say, um, doesn't that like kind of throw a wrench in that uh, Muhammad died in 632 in a way? Yeah. So as I say, one of another one of these sources that just it's not a hundred percent because it doesn't say a hundred percent that he's alive, but it gives the impression that he's talking about someone alive. You know? I mean, again, you have to bear in mind this is a world in which, you know, there's not CNN news. So, you know, there's not <laughs> breaking news. Mohammed just died, people. <laughs> not, so, sorry, forget that one. So, you know, he's a, a few hundred miles away operating Mohammed in theory. But, but that's just to put it out that there's not 100%. He does not say Mohammed, you know, this guy is, this problem is called Mohammed. He doesn't say that. And he doesn't say he's definitely alive now and he's definitely heading for Jerusalem to capture it. But nevertheless, with these sources, there's about 11 of them, giving this impression that one Muhammad arrives later than 632, that he's operating in Palestine, and that there seems to be a certain connected with a kind of apocalyptic motivation. So there's an implication there. But. I'm going to go out on a complete speculative guess type thing to just throw at you to get your thoughts on. Because the development of any religion that, that starts to develop, it takes on early stages seem to be, and I just say seem to be, using my knowledge of biblical studies with Christianity, mm -hmm. um, far more different than what you would expect once it's orthodox. So once you look at it as orthodox, you're like, okay, hold on. There were people who say that the Judean God was evil and there was a God above that God. Like I'm giving you analogies, but Imagine, and, and I'll just throw this out there, is there anyone out there that's serious that actually hypothesized that, that Muhammad wasn't the last prophet, but that the caliph might be in the place kind of like filling in, like uh, I put the shoes of the prophet on, and so they now are representatives of the prophet? I didn't know because this gets later into the numismatics that we're going to get into about the standing caliph mm -hmm. who's holding a sword. Like – this guy is the new representative of God on earth. Uh, mm. Hard for me to know if early Islam had the caliphs or the leader of whatever it might be at the time as a representative of the prophet, or is it possible that, and we'll get to the image, I'm sure, that that is the prophet, an image of the prophet. And I don't know. It's a good question to ask, but mm. do you, does anyone serious in scholarship think that? So that may be easier to wait till you've got the coin there, because that, that's a uh, totally sure where you're going with that. But the, the more general point of it's almost inevitable that what's the ideology of the early decades during and just after Muhammad's lifetime is going to be radically different. Yeah, the transition of authority, which is the kind of bigger picture of what you're aiming at from Prophet mm -hmm. to Caliph, is intriguing and what a caliph actually is the, the reason i said wait for the coin is i'm not totally sure now is what whether you talk about the representation what do we actually see on the coin right or the separate question of how has the transfer of authority worked from Muhammad himself to his followers because that's always a tricky time of course it's, it's the same with you know jesus dying you know what do we do now <laughs> when yeah. you've had this very charismatic leader and they haven't especially if they've got an apocalyptic kind of bent to them because they're not expecting there to be any continuity you know this the end of the world is about to happen why do i need to suggest to you know someone to succeed me there's not going to be any succession oh so that's a great a point <laughs> yeah the, i read that book um leslie hazelton she's no scholar but she's fun you know to listen to especially mm. someone new into the subject matter after the prophet the shiite mm. sunni split and seeing how the the Shiite look at the four, you know, caliph and they see Ali is like the final, this is our guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you have the Sunni say, no, 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 it's the community. It's the, it's, there's this huge divide even to this day. And it's kind of sad, mm -hmm. honestly, but it is what it is. You know, you can't help it. Um, 
I, I just I say that to say like I wonder if there's also a divergent view of the caliph filling in because now that the prophet's gone, the leader is this prophet figure still, but that gets stamped out and they say, no, no, no. This kind of like uh, some Christian movements say, hey, those gifts of speaking in tongues and and all this stuff, that ceased. That's, that's stuff that only the Lord and his apostles did, and other people are still practicing it today. So it makes me wonder what we may or may not know. It's just a big question, that's all. So. Mm. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. And the first Arab Civil War, which is starts already around 656, it, it, it definitely, you know, it's difficult for us to follow, but it is definitely about what should happen next. What sort of leader are we expecting? You know, who should lead us now? Who should, and, and we're talking about someone who's getting control of these vast resources that are being accumulated, huge amounts of booty being captured. So, you know, there's a lot of people rubbing their hands and they could be one piece of that, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I noticed that it was, uh, I think, the third caliph that was like really about power and money. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, not saying no, all men and, you know, we're human, but I'm saying uh, one of them, from what I understood, and I could be wrong, uh, was, and it wasn't Abu Bakr, I don't think, and it wasn't, was it? I can't remember. I, I You would know better than I would, but they were more about like political power and, and, uh, and, and money, of course, even uh, supposedly. Think yeah. the, the tricky but, thing is what drives these because <laughs> rather interestingly each of these characters Abu Bakr is like the rather prudent cautious one Omar is the slightly you know rutted a bit you know cut off the guy's head before he's questioned him you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know he's like a bit hasty uh, but his heart's in the right place and then Osman is meant to be the one who's much more interested in money and power but where these characterizations come from I mean we're reading them 200 years later do they ultimately all go back to a real character that's there and that's still shone through? Or is it really uh, arguments that have happened over the, you know, those two centuries? It is really difficult to, to know that because unfortunately for the caliphs, we really don't have any other contemporary way in. The mm. Christians and Jews don't really seem to notice these leaders. Uh, if wow. only with Ma'awi in domestic. I mean, it's possibly partly because they're deep down in... Arabia, where you know, non-Muslims aren't going, and it's only once they get to Damascus, which is obviously a you know major settled center of power, that they take notice, and that's why it's Ma'awiyah in Damascus that everyone notices, but not what's going on before that. Wow, <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next example: Zuk. Is it the Zuknan Chronicle? Yeah. 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 This this is an interesting uh, this is an interesting one. I was popping up here. If I may, can you tell us about this chronicle? Was Muhammad with them during the conquest mentioned in the chronicle, right? So uh, these are repetitive. It seems there seems to be a theme potentially uh, uh, in my questions, of course. <laughs> was he there? Was he? Was, did this? Uh, did he try to take over uh, Jerusalem and such? Um, please fill us in on this this uh, chronicle. What a little bit of background knowledge, and then what is going on, if you don't mind. Yeah, so the Zuknin refers to a monastery just outside modern Diyarbakir. I was actually there last month. Um, beautiful city. And yeah, just on the north outside the city walls is this monastery. He's a monk, this guy at this monastery. He's writing his chronicle. 775, that's okay, that's 100, you know, some odd years later than Muhammad. But what the way these chronicles work is they tend to copy an earlier one and then just update it. For their lifetime so this guy is copying earlier material that doesn't guarantee it's right or wrong but it is it, it means it's, it's going back further again it's in syriac again so syriac christians are a big a, a dominant proportion of the christians in the middle east in the seventh century those who speak syriac as their mother tongue again it's an it's not a, a total statement of Muhammad was alive then and doing this at this time, but it's another nail in the coffin, if you like, or another, you know, quiver to the bow, you know, adding weight to this argument that Muhammad was alive. Right. It starts to then, I suppose, lead on to the question, does, why does it matter? And that, I imagine your viewers are thinking, who cares? Did he die in 632, 634? Who cares? What's the, the difference? So the argument for those like Patricia Kroner, more recently 
to machine Mecca for why this matters. Well, what they say is happening is later, when the Muslim historians want to move away from this apocalyptic explanation, you know, idea of their origins. And in the end, it's not just about did they forge it or change it. It doesn't make sense anymore. You know, everyone has this. You look back, or if you get older, you look back and say, why the hell was I doing that? <laughs> what, was, what was I at? <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it ceases to make sense because the world changes. The context is so different that you can't think, why did I actually ever do that in the first place? That was a really stupid thing. So you can imagine that as the world has changed, you know, the whole empire is now there and it's got a lot of solidity to it. So the idea of it being founded on a sense that the world was about to end seems a bit crazy. So you rework it. That's what we all do. You know, some of them, it's interesting. Some people retain a sense of what they originally thought and just think it's weird. Some people actually edit out the whole thing and they have no contact anymore with what they originally thought when they were you know, like a teenager or something. Um, but yeah, so it gets, you could argue it's got edited out. And what they do is they edit it out by putting, keeping Muhammad in Arabia and dying before those conquests actually happen. So let's put a cap on it, 632, and he stays in Arabia. Let's keep it at that. And then the next guy is the one who leads the conquest. So the way of cutting off one from that apocalyptic dimension, but also from that Jewish dimension, that kind of Muslim Jewish sort of ideology. By the ninth century, they want to keep it a, a very full on Muslim ideology, and they want it centered on Mecca. So if the original aim was to capture Jerusalem, then that's a very different proposal. You know, it's a very different focus, whereas they want the focus now to be very much Mecca and Medina. That's it, that's our holy land. Nothing to do with Palestine or Jerusalem anymore. So it's a, a shift in direction. And that, that's why this like wanting to cap the death date, a geographical movement of Muhammad occurs. That, that's what the theory would say, anyway. Yeah, this is a fascinating uh, discussion. I'm really enjoying these these ideas. None of this is certain. It's just a great way of trying to consider like what would be a motivating factor for doing this. And to me, I, I always refer back. I do this with every Islamic scholar that I talk to, or you know, Quranic scholar, you name it, the history of Islam and such. And I always refer back to what I know, which is biblical stuff. And so I say, okay, uh, someone might want to ask, like, why would they, why would they have uh, Jesus appearing to them in Jerusalem instead of Galilee? And in the first two gospels, mm. you know, that we think chronologically occurred, then it goes to Jerusalem. Well, why then? Uh, why is he born in Bethlehem? But at first, he was in Nazareth. They're 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 trying to fulfill prophecy, probably. And there's other explanations that can see see fitting these later gospels into certain narratives. So with what you're suggesting, it makes a lot of sense to me that if you want to paint a narrative where he's not in contact with sources potentially for influence on the Quran, which has become a text by the time this is being written and it's solidified that this is an empire wide text. I wonder if critics and polemics have been jabbed. For example, I'm using Gospel of Matthew, and I know I'm jumping around, but this is what I know. Uh, they put guards at the tomb. No other gospel has guards at the tomb. And he says, well, these people till this day, the author seems to indicate till this day, there are people who say, uh, you know, that he didn't rise from the dead. So we have guards there protecting. So no one stole the body. Don't don't quit saying that the body was stolen. Uh, we had guards there to protect it. So there's a polemic to defend it. And I wonder if that's something that later, like you're talking about, safeguarding it, making it only Mecca, and uh, they're willing to allow them at Mecca Medina, but not the Jerusalem narrative, if there was a Jerusalem conquest that he was involved in. And then another question in that vein, I know I'm throwing a bunch out there, but just to, just to get your opinion, is when they once were turned toward Jerusalem, and then he says, stop, we're turning this way now, do you think that might potentially play a significant role in this whole did he die in 632 or six, you know or later was he alive during mm -hmm. this conquest do you think that that turning of which direction of prayer might play a role in this whole theme of things we're discussing yeah it's quite a fascinating point because in the biographies of muhammad it just says that the first direction of prayer was towards jerusalem but then muhammad changed it and it's kind of, why was it towards Jerusalem, for heaven's sake? You, you know, you're a long way to the south, so it should 
it's not obvious what the connection is. So it's and it's just not explained in the biographies of Muhammad or anywhere. It's just simply okay, that's how it was. But then Muhammad changed it. Um, so it's certainly a kind of quite interesting indicator of that sense that Judaism in some form was very important to Muhammad and the first followers of Muhammad and therefore that you know, Jerusalem was significant to them. It doesn't mean they were Jews, some people have argued they were Jews, but it just means that there must have been strong influence. And, and there were quite a few Jewish communities. We know this actually from inscriptions that were left. There were a few Jewish, Aramaic and Hebrew inscriptions uh, the, all the way down the northwest of Saudi Arabia. So they're certainly a major community. So there could have been a big influence on Muhammad. Right. Seems like that. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sean Anthony was explaining like these, w I think even most uh, Muslims would agree like that there are a lot of legends that come later, uh, but w really interesting. Like he's walking and then a monk says, oh, that guy under the tree, look, that's, he's mm. a prophet. And then, and then you have mm. this Christian monk, then you got a, uh, you have a rabbi, you know, you get, and then you get mm. this pagan, mm. even though like a pagan supposedly from the land is like, Oh, he's definitely one of the mm -hmm. chosen. Mm -hmm. So it's like everybody's like pointing yeah. the finger, and I wonder how much influence from various groups sit, play a role. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's interesting. I'll give us another example if you want, unless you want yeah. to comment further. I'm just going to point out that although I mean, that part of Saudi modern Saudi Arabia, so the, it's called the Hejaz, where Muhammad is Mecca Medina, it's a fair way south of Palestine, Syria, you know, the more settled areas. Nevertheless, this is a trade route going down from, you know, Gaza to Yemen. So, you know, ideas percolate through and there are, there have been long contacts. I mean, the Romans got as far south as that area and had a, a city uh, at a place called Madain Saleh, so, which is fairly near, it's actually mentioned in the Quran. So, you know, it's in contact. It's not a remote isolated region in the end it's still in contact with the rest of the settled world so yeah the jewish christian pagan ideas religious ideas are definitely circulating around and have an in influence thank you dr hoyland all right another example we have is this uh fancy smancy uh <laughs> uh, image here and this this blue mm -hmm. dot that i have highlighted i think that's the name muhammad and this was something i think you highlighted uh, yeah, this had my blue dot. <laughs> yeah, your blue dot. I <laughs> ownership of this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us, um, if you don't mind, about this? Is it Khuzestan? Chronicle? Yes. Khuzestan is a province in southwest Iran, um, which has a fair Christian community. Again, they're using Syriac as their main language. And this guy is, again, a monk. They're Monks are often the main people writing these chronicles at the time. And he's written this nice little text giving its history from around 580 to 660. Nice little slab of time. He's probably continuing on from an earlier chronicle. And it's fascinating in a number of ways because he, so we're starting, the, the next one you'll get on to, I think he's going to be Sabaeus, isn't it? Who's the one who does a yes. hell of a lot. So these two are exact contemporaries. Sabaeus and the Khuzestan Chronicle, both writing about 660. And a bit more news is percolating through. So the 630s ones, they, they just know, oh, there was a battle here. You know, as Muhammad and the Romans, that's all they really know. 660s, there's a bit more news. Prisoners of war or escapees from war going back to their homes and telling people about what's going on. So we've got a bit more news. So this guy, he talks about the conquest. And he says their leader, Davrono, in the Syriac, it's a fairly neutral term, was Muhammad. Again, it seems Say like that again, you, you broke out. I'm sorry. Muhammad. Say that again. Sorry, you yeah. said, uh... so he, says, he says that Muhammad was their leader for the you know, conquerors. So the term is Mundabrono in Syriac. It's a very basic word for just somebody who organizes and leads something. But it's interesting. He does appear to suggest you could say, well, he's in southwest Iran, a hell of a distance away. He doesn't really know, but he does seem to say that Muhammad led the conquest, the initial conquest. And yet another really fascinating bit where he actually talks a 
Bao, because he's, 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 he's getting curious now. The conquests are a bit more substantial now. They're, the Arabs are conquering some fairly large areas of the Middle East, so he wants to know a bit more. And one of the things he's been told is that there's a place where Muhammad comes from, which is connected with Abraham. And it's kind of interesting because the Kaaba that's in Mecca, the place to which Muslims pray, is said by Muslims to be the place where Abraham and his son Ishmael built the first Kaaba and where they set up the first prayer. So it suggests he's getting some information from Muslims themselves, probably indirectly via others who've come into contact with them, served them maybe or saving prisoners of war. So we're getting a little bit more information now about the conquerors, which gives it a little bit more weight as well. This just keeps adding weight to what we've been saying about mm -hmm. potentially Muhammad being alive after the time that it's painted he died. Um, you know, something came to mind, and I forgot to mention uh, or ask you in particular uh, this this question. When we when I interviewed Dr. Sean Anthony in his book pertaining to the doctrine of Jacob, if I may, it sounds – so there's this debate on this section in this uh, in this document where there's a statement about Muhammad and they say, oh, he's a person of truth. We claim to have the keys to paradise. Mm. And most of the scholars from what I – I think I heard uh, Dr. Anthony write in his book, or heard, <laughs> read, uh, where he said that they think that this is a jab at the Petrine Christian concept of, well, I have the keys to the kingdom that we see in the Gospels, but he thinks there might be something more to this about paradise and, um, you know, jihad. And so what are your thoughts? Where do you stand on the issue? Because I know that everyone has different issues do you mm. think that this is an early apocalyptic jab <sighs> so by, i have to say i mean I, i'm going to defer to sean on this because he's a bigger expert on this particular text i tend not to want to put a huge amount of weight on very tiny bits of, <laughs> of text uh, and what and especially it's quite difficult for us to get into the to, to build up enough of a picture for the contemporary Christian and Jewish thinking to understand what lies behind this. All the problem is, are they using Christian vocabulary really to explain a more general point that Muhammad is saying he knows how to get into paradise? I mean, and for heaven's sake, doesn't every um, prophet, Abrahamic prophet say that, that you know, this is the way to get into paradise, so it's hardly anything special? Or, or is there something very specific about the keys and that it, you he means a very specific way of getting into paradise, like, as you said, Jihad. To, to my mind, there's no way for us to, that's always going to be speculation because there's just right. not enough information there. But I can see the point, and it's, it's an interesting one, but it's a bit speculative Thank you. to my mind. Yeah, and that's fine. I, I appreciate your honest uh, response. So we're going into the Sabios yeah. of Bagra Tunis. Am I saying that right? Bagra Tunis? The Sabios of Bagra Tunis? I hope I'm saying yeah. his name. That's 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 what I'm hoping is correct. In 660 AD, I wanted to give an, a medieval depiction just to give people visuals. Mm -hmm. They can actually see mm -hmm. <laughs> what he may have been uh, looked like. And on the right, of course, the text. It's an Armenian history. So uh, as I show that, uh, the question is, one second, pulling this up here. Um, Sebios, did do we have an early manuscript of it? If not then how do we know that the Sabios we have is what is said originally? I guess that's a question to ask. And then um, maybe get your comments on that, and I'll play if, or show a few images and play a clip that uh, kind of goes in the vein of what we've been discussing. Yeah, so no, it's a lot later manuscript, like 12th century, but, um, you know, very uh, as I say, Pretty much all the uh, text we have, which is amazing, really, pretty much every single work of Greek that still survives from the classical world in the late. So, but when you see that you have a cohesive text, so this history of Sabaeus, it's not just fragments, it is a cohesive text. It's extremely detailed and consistent in its style uh, and content. So there's no particular reason to doubt that it, there really is this text. Generally, what you worry about with these late copies is whether there's been 
there are minor typographic, you know, there's copies, copy and copy. They make small mistakes and things, but there's no reason to doubt the whole, the text as a whole, that it is the history of this person. Another cleric writing, as I say, about 660-ish, way up in Armenia. Um, so Bagratun is a, well, it's a, a royal house, if you like, but yeah, way up near modern Armenia, Devin, which is just outside Yerevan. Um, but he says he, he got this from eyewitnesses and people who were actually present at the events. And he's, he does specify prisoners of war who managed to escape and get back to their homeland. So he seems to have some good information. And it is very detailed. I don't really want to put up the actual story. I can bring up the text. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't have the actual, um, like in its original, it's mm. obviously the English translation. So here's just one on Sebios, uh, page 96, I believe it was, and uh, the highlighted section. So, so Muhammad, and notice how M-A-H-M-E-T, how they spell his name, uh, legislated for them not to eat carrion, not to drink wine, not to speak falsely, and not to engage in fornication. He said with an oath, God promised this land to Abraham and his seed after him forever. And he brought about, as he promised during that time while he loved Israel, but now you are the sons of Abraham, and God is accomplishing his promise to Abraham and his seed for you. Love sincerely only the God of Abraham, and go and seize your land with God, uh, which God gave to your father Abraham. No one will be able to re resist you in battle because God is with you. Then all they gathered in unison from Ewila, or, yeah, Ewila as far as Sur, which is opposite Egypt, and they went from the desert of Paran. Twelve tribes according to the... Now, I don't know, you know if we're getting into myth here uh, in legend or if they're really self-fulfilling it in a sense and and, and mm. formulating their army in 12 sections or something because that could be the case but um mm. as far as this seems like he's talking about the holy land jerusalem again yeah so he's got he's a really fascinating or he's the first one who gives us quite an extended account because before that passage that you have he has a whole bit beforehand where he describes how some jews who from odessa who had been, so this, he's writing about the very end of the war between the Romans and the Persians. Lots of Persians are, because they've been there 20 years or so, are in cities around the edges of the Persian Empire, like Edessa, which is now in southeast Turkey, very major city at the time. And Jews had also followed along with the Persians, um, because they kind of cooperated with them, hoping to get access, particularly to Jerusalem. So when the Romans win, they kick out the Persians and the Jews. And so Sabaoth says, oh, the Jews from Edessa, they head down to Arabia. They meet up with Muhammad and then teach them. They explain to him about some doctrines of Judaism and they all go and invade Palestine to capture Jerusalem. So he's very explicit. He even says about how the Muslims and the Jews rebuild the temple together. Wow. Of Jerusalem. This is, wow, serious stuff. But... <laughs> Sabaoth has three sources of information. Well, three things that motivate his writing. One is these first-hand accounts from prisoners of war. He, he must have some because there's a lot of close detail on certain things which must be known to, especially about Palestine, which he wouldn't know. So he got some good information from real witnesses. Now, this is the Bible. And you can really see this in that bit that you quoted, there's a lot of yeah. biblical, from Havilah and Tashur is a direct quotation from the, the tribes gathering together of Israel. This is all directly from the Bible. And then his third source is basically his own lively imagination. <laughs> so he's putting together this quite interesting story. So he, he probably has heard that there are Jews who are operating with Muhammad's armies. And he then picks up the fact that from Odessa there was a Jewish community that was expelled by the Romans. And so we think, ah, maybe it was these guys who head down and they meet up with Muhammad. So, and some of it's uh, kind of Jewish apocalyptic material. Um, so he, the, the question is the relative weight, I suppose. Could you isolate out the contemporary witnesses and their accounts from the biblical and then Sabaeus's own thinking as he tries to put together this account into something coherent. And this is where people are going to argue. Um, his is probably the main reason or basis for the book Hagarism, 
by Croner and Cook because it's very clear that you have Muhammad's community and the Jews cooperating together to capture Palestine on a basis of apocalyptic ideology. So there's a re effectively it's Sabaos who first outlines this theory and Croner and Cook take it up and give it much more um, solid analysis and bring in many more sources. But Sabaos is at the base of this. If you're skeptical, you'll just say, well, he's just used lots of biblical stereotypes and it, it's mainly the Bible um, and his own imagination. Others would like to feel, no, 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 there's a lot of good contemporary observation there. This, so we should really take this seriously. This is the sort of thing I'd give students and say, hey, have a go at teasing that out. <laughs> because it's a, it's a wonderful text to read. But it is, it's a it's difficult to identify when there's not enough information, people fall back on their prejudices and own particular perspectives on, on the world. And so, <laughs> so yeah. this is a case where you get people arguing quite strongly in opposite directions, not just going to reflect where they're coming from and how they see the world. This this begs a question because I I thought about this earlier this morning and yesterday when I was prepping for the show, Hagarism. You know what would be the motivating factor for saying you are an Ishmaelite or a descendant of Ishmael, right? And you bring up an interesting point. I guess I need to read that book uh, to get my head wrapped around why would because I'm thinking and this is someone who's read biblical account though he's a seed of Abraham. Okay, he's a descendant, and yes, he's promised to be. You know, uh, he'll ha he'll be a ruler of nations and stuff. He doesn't get a good image and outlook if you read their Hebrew Bible. It's like Ishmael's kind of a wild man, uh, and I'm not going to use the term, but they, you know, they, they're, you know, it doesn't look good for Ishmael. But yet, I guess it's good in some ways because he's going to be a ruler of nations. I don't know. What would be their motivation factor? Do you think that they said, well, we're brothers with Isaac. So Isaac and Ishmael, we're going to find ways to be brothers. And they kind of look over that polemic against, against Ishmael, biblically speaking. I don't know. I'm throwing it to you to maybe get your opinion mm. on it. Yeah, it would be nice to know what the backstory to the Quran was. So in the Quran, it's very clear that Abraham and his son Ishmael are uh, so Abraham, obviously, you know, key character in Judaism as well, but Ishmael is a good guy. He's very important. He's central. And it's just as in the beginning of the gospel, you get this tracing back of Jesus's genealogy to David. You get the same where Muhammad is traced back to Abraham because Ishmael, father of the Arabs. And so you have a direct line. So this is key, this Abrahamic genealogy, both in terms of descent and actually the religious belief is key to the Quran and its vision because the Quran isn't saying, Hey, here's a brand new religion for you guys to follow. Right. It's saying this is the original religion that Muhammad gave to Moses and Abraham. Moses and Abraham are the two key figures in the Quran. Moses, the early you know, recipient of God's religion and Abraham was continuing it. And passing it on to all nations, including the Arabs. And so this is the original religion. You know, the Christians just went off the wall a bit with Jesus, who was only meant to be a prophet. You know? So th this is the Quran's perspective. And by tapping into Abraham in this way, Muhammad is able to give to his people, if you like, his followers, and Arabs around him a sense that they're part of that original religion. Is this an old idea? This is something we would, it would be nice to know more. There is one account that tends to be used, a sixth century church historian, who, Dr. Menas, who does actually say that some Jews who came down into Arabia taught the Arabs that they were descended from Abraham. So uh -huh. even if not quite as good as being a son of Isaac, it's pretty good being a son of Abraham, Ishmael, because you still tap directly into Abraham. And so they told them that, so you are brothers to us and, you know, you should circumcise and so on so we can be one people. So the, the, there is some sense that this might be an earlier ideology that's been latent. It's one of many ideologies, perhaps, bubbling around Arabia. And then Muhammad takes it up and runs with it. We don't really have enough information to know. But 
it's important that's there and it, it's obviously is important right to the earliest muslims and say both the chronicle of khuzistan and sabaos both mention this connection with abraham and they've obviously had that reported indirectly from the muslims themselves and so this is one of the early dimensions of islam for sure the connection with abraham and arabs as descendants of abraham and therefore inheriting his legacy which means both worship of the one god and ruling the earth that yeah. will have a, a nation that will rule over all earth so the quran actually loosen paraphrases uh, the psalms on that point that you as the sons of abraham will inherit the earth so there's a a definite hint of an ideology there that continues on to some extent into um, later Islamic times too. There's something interesting too. I don't know if there's even a connection, but you, you spark curiosity in my thinking. Mm. Uh, I've interviewed Dr. Z. Bendor Benit. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He, mm. he wrote a book, uh, a world history of the lost tribes of Israel. And you know, we read an account in Josephus. Josephus talks about, well, the 10 northern tribes, they're beyond the Euphrates. They're without number. They're innumerable. Mm. Um, and then you have, well, there's two tribes here in Jerusalem. And he's talking about, or in Rome, I mean, uh, the Judah and ben Benjamin. And he's going into this history since the Assyrian conquest in the 8th century BC all the way down. And eventually, like, they're out there trying to find the lost tribes. And at some mm. point, mm. I don't know historically, I'd, I'd love to have him back on maybe to discuss in this region of, you know, sixth, seventh century, uh, what might be happening. Are they exploring regions saying you people might be our brethren? I, I don't know. It just kind of makes me wonder if this motif is, is significant in what you're suggesting, because in order for the end to happen and apocalyptic fever was all over the place, the lost Israelites, according to Jewish scripture, are supposed to be regathered in order for it to happen. And they, everyone knows this. Even mm. Christians who want to try and like bring Jews back to the, to the Holy Land are thinking they're going to bring the apocalypse and the second coming upon us mm. by doing that. So mm. it, it, it is an interesting – I think there's some weight to what you're suggesting, and can we prove it? Uh, not maybe off the data we have. We can speculate, mm. but it's really fun. Mm. So, um, yeah. Did you want yeah, to comment on you're that? right. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. And that's what Sabaoth is also um, tapping into, this idea that all the believing tribes of Israel and their affiliates, if you like, will be brought in and be ready for the second coming when, you know, heaven on earth and so on. So, yeah, he taps into that idea. I mean, Judaism is interesting at the time because it's not, we think of it as a more tightly described community, which it's, you can potentially join, but it's a, it's a very limited club, if you like. Um, but at the time, Judaism was spreading, doing pretty well. So in Saudi Arabia, and that the ruling group there had only certain sections had converted to Judaism in the course of the fifth and sixth centuries. And actually way up in the Caucasus, the Khazars, who are somewhere around modern Azerbaijan, southern Russia, certain sectors of their ruling elite had converted to Judaism too. So it, it's not such a restricted faith. So it's, it's not quite, so the lost tribes of Israel as an ideology has a sense, I suppose, of a certain who is Israel and who isn't. Yeah. And, but that's not so much true in the sixth, seventh century. You could join. So they, many Jewish communities were actively engaging in conversion as well. So partly because of the, they would, didn't do, they were suffering quite a bit in the Roman Empire by the sixth, seventh century. So bringing in certain powerful actors like the Khazar, South Arabian kings, then it might bring you extra defense and protection. Mm. And in particular, they probably did want to get back. There's a lot of Jewish apocalyptic at the time from the seventh, early seventh century. I suppose they see the Initially, the Persians attacking the Romans and doing really well. The Persians initially have ma make massive conquests. 614, they take Jerusalem. So the Jews are really excited. Wow, you know, maybe because they have good relations with the Persians, you can get Jerusalem back now. And there's a lot of apocalyptic accounts about them rebuilding the Temple of Jerusalem. It's often a bit difficult for us to be sure where the apocalyptic, you know, where the reality and apocalyptic begins. So there's still people who argue about it. They definitely rebuild the temple, but it looks as though they probably did. And then, you know, the Arabs come in and beat 
the Romans and say, oh, once again, oh, maybe we'll get the <laughs> temple in Jerusalem back again. So there's a lot of conflicting <laughs> excitement. And we do, so you could, a lot of motivation for them to certainly side with the uh, Muhammad's uh, Arabs, you know, to try and recapture Palestine at least have a part in it and be allowed to prop this because they've been excluded from Jerusalem. So this was a big goal at the time. Wow. Thank you so much for that response. I've got a couple uh, more here on the Sebios thing. This uh, right here says uh, the said Muhammad had begun as a young man to go up and down from his sit his own city of Yithrib to Palestine for reasons of commerce, both buying and selling. Uh, that is how he became familiar with that country and the monotheistic religion. So uh, this is already uh, polemic, if you will, uh, that, that it, like, like, you know, this would go against the tradition is what I'm trying to get at, um, mm -hmm. that he learned this through this. But uh, back at home, he would expound this religion to his tribesmen, a few of whom were convinced and became his followers. When speaking to them on these matters, he used also to extol the quality of the land in Palestine. And he maintained that it was because they confessed that unique God that such a good and fertile land had been given to them. Then he would add, if you listen to me, you too will have a good land flowing with milk and honey as a gift from God. To back this uh, this claim, he gathered those who were amenable into a band and began to lead them up to a raid uh, to raid the land of Palestine. So there seems to be a clear uh, affirmative. And then uh, here in West Syrian Chronicles, one raiding expedition to Palestine and back was naturally followed by another. So it seems like like all of these non-Muslim sources seem to be indicating. <laughs> If we want to generalize that this is like, well, they're, they're followers of Muhammad. This is all it is. So we're kind of mm. stuck with um, – where is this uh, image I'd like to show you that I have uh, in particular? It, it, it seems like you either have – it's not Abu Bakr. It's Omar, isn't it? Uh, who, who's the, the first caliph? Because it's either between them or, or Muhammad himself that actually goes, if I'm not mistaken. So Abu Bakr is the first. Sorry, goes in the sense of what – I'm sure what you're referring uh, to there. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to figure out if it wasn't Muhammad, then it would have been a claim for one of the caliph, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, possibly. Been... If you just yeah, I mean, in the end, I suppose you, the question is just: is it a totally manufactured account in the sense that they're trying to explain what's happened? How how is this all? come about the, that the Arabs set off, they conquer all these places and so on. How is it? So you could, if you want to be very skeptical, say, well, they know that there was a Muhammad and they know that there are Arabs that conquered all these lands. And so they just put, you know, the two things together. If you wanted to be very skeptical, I don't think you need to think that it was someone else instead of Muhammad. I don't know. Got Possibly. it. But it, well, it's difficult joining up, how much you join up the dots, I suppose, is the question. But, but to be honest, he's, he's a convincing person. <laughs> he seems to have a very coherent account there. But it is filled with biblical topoi, of course. So, right. Um, it's difficult. Some of it is, is, a lot of, the Muslim accounts allow some of this, so that Muhammad mm -hmm. is a trader. Well, that's there, as you can see in Tabeos. Then he goes on trading journeys towards you know, the Roman Empire and the very edges, you know, he's actually, you alluded earlier to an account where he's recognized as a prophet by a monk. And that's meant to have happened near a place called Bostra, which is a Roman city um, on the edges of the Roman Empire towards, you know, Arabia. I mean, now it's in the very south of Syria near the Jordanian border, but it would have been in the, you know, if you like, southeastern border of the Roman territory. So Muhammad does get up that far, not as a conqueror, but just as a trader. Um, so if you like, it's allowed a bit by the Muslim sources. So is it the case that they've just kind of minimized it, if you like, and they've kind of dragged him back down mainly to stay in Arabia, but actually he gets further. Hmm. But it, it, yeah, I, I would say the question is, always the problem is, there's no clear outside verification. And so in the end, it'll be a case of do you consider, I think I actually reviewed Stephen Shoemaker's book on death of a prophet. And as I said, you could take it where we have 11, at least indications that Muhammad was alive after 632 and led conquest to Palestine. So do you take it that, you know, that's, it's 
pretty incriminating to have 11, you know, even indirect references. So yes, it would be nice to have that clinching statement that puts Muhammad exactly in you know, <laughs> Jerusalem in 34. But in the absence of that, you could say, well, there's quite a lot of convincing circumstantial evidence and indirect references. Okay, I'm going to play a short clip uh, that you that was with you. Uh, I think it was in Saudi Arabia. I might it might have been not Saudi Arabia. It might have been in Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, I'm going to play the short clip, and then we'll get into some numismatics, um, if that's okay with you. Just coins for those yeah. who don't know, and and to get your thoughts about them. It's really fun to entertain that. So let me play this clip, and then maybe I have a question for you. We'll get into numismatics. One of the observations that are made by non-Muslim sources are a bit difficult to know what to, to deal with. So, for example, they say that Muhammad is alive during the conquest of Jerusalem. So he's alive. He, in the Muslim accounts, he dies in Arabia. And that's it. Before the conquest had properly started, that happens with his successor, Abu Bakr. But in a number of Christian sources, they have him go to Palestine. And the aim, it seems, they, it seems is that he wants to ca capture Jerusalem. Jerusalem is key to his program in the Christian account, but that's not really there in the Muslim account. Yeah, I just, just I, I found that a fascinating. Unfortunately, that was muted for me, unfortunately. <laughs> I could see it, but not hear it. What was I saying? <laughs> so uh, in that particular, you were just simply pointing out that the non-Muslim sources have him heading to Jerusalem. That's part of his key, right. his key thing. And then the Muslim account, of course, uh, has him die in um, Arabia. And, mm. you know, uh, are there any non-Muslim accounts that actually say he died outside of Arabia or something? Muslim or non-Muslim? No, so no one actually mentions his death in our, of, outside Arabia in the non-Muslim accounts. No. Interesting. No, it's just that specific point about him leading conquest. So before I get off that subject, the question I wanted to ask is, this is a really interesting subject. It makes me want to have Dr. Shoemaker and others. Is, um, why would, if we, we, we can point out clear factors why Muslims would want to have him die in Arabia and have him not want to uh, go out beyond you know, for apocalyptic reasons, political reasons, polemic reasons against the prophet, divorcing themselves from Jewish uh, roots or whatever may be the case. Do you have any good still man arguments if I were to give like, let's 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 still man it. Let's give mm -hmm. the benefit of the doubt and try to say mm -hmm. these non-Muslim sources, their biases for wanting him to go to Jerusalem and wanting to place him there and, uh, you know, catch him red handed, so to speak, trying to take over is is there a way to explain that that makes as much sense? It sounds like the other idea makes more sense to me personally, that these later, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a good point, actually. I, I think the only thing wouldn't be that they have a motive for placing him in Palestine. It would, it would just be a false assumption. Um, they know that the Arab armies are in Palestine and captured Jerusalem. They know Muhammad is their prophet. And they just put them together. That would be the only. So it would only be that they just hadn't got it right. But you're right. That's uh, you could argue a weak argument. Yeah. And that it makes more sense just simply to accept that they did know what they were talking about. Um, but you do have to remember, as I say, the setup in a pre-modern world. You know, think away all the vehicles for getting or in microphones and <laughs> transmissions ways we can transmit information and think of it as being people having to travel large distances often by foot and so there's a lot of potential for misinformation if you like there's a lot enough potential for misinformation in our world actually but um, but it would mean so that we do always have to bear in mind that they don't necessarily have good, good access to accurate, direct right. um, sources. But I do agree with you that the only so the only reason people a few moments later.
Dr. Hoyland, uh, you broke up for a second there and uh, we had to readjust things. So what um, what were you getting at? Do you recall the final things you were saying? Oh, just the problem of our sources. Ideally, given that it's relying on one source is problematic, you want to try and get some, a number of different types of verification, you know, from different sources. Um, because otherwise, and the main, as I say, people who argue against Sabaos being right will say, oh, well, he was just misinformed. He's putting two and two together and getting five, you know, and that's certainly a possibility. But your argument, <laughs> and the argument of yeah, Kroner and Cook and Schumacher is a strong one. There's a lot of, you know, even if it's indirect references, there's a lot of them and they seem to be going in the same direction. Okay, final thing I, I'd like to ask you, uh, in, in that vein of the death of the prophet, what sources did Islamic scholars have to suggest that he did die in 632? Like, like, I mean, if we're going to investigate and we want to turn over every stone to make sure we're, we're figuring out what, where, when, how, why, and all that, um, if these sources come later, like, how can they be confident he did die in 632? when we do have non-Muslim sources, seemingly if we take Dr. Shoemaker, for example, to the bank and say, okay, they're, they're, let's say they are saying that the, the prophet was heading up and down to Jerusalem, trying to conquer it. And he's involved in that. Um, if that is the case, where do the Muslims get their source that he died in 632? Do we have any evidence of that or no? So I should probably say initially, they're very different types of sources. What we have, from the Christian and the Muslim sources. They're, they're different materials. So the Christian stuff tends to be rather small snippets of stuff within a, a chronicle. It's not their main thing. I mean, Thomas the Presbyter is one tiny entry for one day <laughs> in, the, in the chronicle that's going back to the beginning of time. <laughs> so it's, it's, Only yeah, no, that much. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't specifically trying to say anything about it. Whereas the Muslim sources we have are directly trying to chronicle Muhammad and the conquest. That's their main thing. So these are very deliberate sources. It's not just an offhand comment. And the, the point here is of, cause when your main aim is to, you know, say you're writing a biography of a person as opposed to just say, oh, yeah, I met that guy the other day, you know, and you saw this, you know, it, it's, you're actually, if you're writing a biography of a person, you're crafting it, you're systematizing, you're, and that's what we see with the Muslim sources. They're very carefully arranged. You know, there's a set, the way the time frame operates is, okay, here's the period, it's called the Jahiliya, when there's no Muhammad, no religion, everyone's pagan, it's all very bad in Arabia. But then Muhammad comes, he brings light and knowledge, and that's his period. And then we move on to this period of the four caliphs in Medina, Abu Bakr, Omar, Osman, and Ali, and those are the four, they're called the rightly divided, um, <laughs> and guided, rightly guided caliphs, and that's a very specific period, 632, 631, and then we move on to Umayyads in Damascus, very clear, 661, you know, so it's very, very carefully arranged. So, and they want to move on from topic to topic, because Muhammad's lifetime is very sacred, he's the prophet. So I'll move on to the four rightly guided caliphs, okay, that down one, it's less you know, divine, and, but it's still very important because they're the successors to Muhammad. And then once we go to Damascus, it's much more regular sort of kingship. So one, they're systematizing, and two, they have this very clear sense of how things should be ideologically. And so what you say is that they're simply drawing a line. Okay, 632 is, that's the end. It's not just the prophet's death, that's the end of prophethood. So we're tying in with a, with a bigger religious agenda, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Because the idea is we switch from prophethood to caliphhood, if you like. <laughs> so this is the time of caliphs now, end of prophets. And that's important for saying there's no prophetic authority anymore. Muhammad was tapped into God. He had authority to say, to make laws, do anything. Caliphs don't have that right. So we've changed the prerogative. Really, they're meant to only implement what Muhammad said. So there's, a, there's an idea, it's not just a chronological shift. There's a whole ideological shift. 
So that's so there's no nobody has gives us evidence for Muhammad's death in any you know concrete way. Yeah. So, and the problem with the Muhammad, the Muslim sources is say that it's difficult to strip away logical shift. I mean, this is one of the things I've tried to do in, in God's path and why they can be very useful, the non-Muslim sources. So as with any victor's narrative, I mean, we talk about the, you know, the British Empire or the French Empire, but actually a good 80% of the British army was made up of non-British people, you know, people from wherever they come, yeah. they get other groups into it. So but you never hear about their story because it's the victors who are telling it. And the same happens with the Muslim sources. They only talk about Muslim Arab conquerors, the fact that many other groups, the Berbers and Persians, and Hathars, and you know, so many different groups are involved and often provided the mainstay of the armies is edited out, you know, and airbrushing just, I mean, as I say, this is the standard thing victors do. You don't want to bother with those low level types as far as you're concerned. You want to focus on the, yeah, the glorious exploits of us, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You do. So, it, you so, do. Sorry. I mean, this is what started the whole, um, and why British Kroner and Michael Cook in the first place said, let's look at these non-Muslim sources to see if it changes our perspective, because they were aware that when we look at Muslim sources, you're getting this very particular perspective of the conqueror. You're not getting, you know, it's just one, and so they wanted a very different perspective. And that's what started this whole ball ro rolling, if you like, of the non-Muslim sources. Yeah, it just makes me wonder, like, how confident should we be on Muslim sources on getting the facts correct on that? It's kind of like, I, I don't know if the comparison can be made because I'm not an Islamic scholar and a Quranic scholar and understanding I don't want to tiptoe or dip our toes in theology at mm -hmm. all. That's not my goal. Uh, but I know by looking at Christian sources, looking at Jewish sources and how they interpret things, um, you can see you can see narratives created about Jesus put Jesus put like words put into his mouth in the way in which he dies uh, or what he may have said when he dies, like, mm. like various things are not accurate. If that makes sense in terms of historically, mm. we, we may not know uh, actually what actually happened when it came to Jesus well-known mm. figure. So uh, when it comes to the prophet, it, we're listening to people who believe who are, theologically driven and potentially politically driven within the mission of a empire that is that is trying to uh conquer and, and take over mm -hmm. and uh it makes me wonder like is it oral tradition that they're claiming that they know these things from 632 of when he died or is this something that at some point they decided well this is when we think the prophet died and here's here's what we're setting up this is our history we've written our history now kind of like antiquity mm -hmm. of the jews josephus does not take everything verbatim he kind of gives his mm -hmm. own intelligent but his own little spin and interpretation into the data of what he's interpreting from the jewish history so mm -hmm. it makes me wonder what's going on i'm very cautious on knowing what's factual and not if that makes sense mm -hmm. i don't know and unfortunately numbers and dates are actually always um you might think it's very neutral but it, it really isn't so it's very important muhammad becomes a prophet at 40. I mean, 40 is like a magical number and, it's, <laughs> and he spends equal time in Mecca and Medina. You know, there's a whole series of, the numbers are crucial. Yeah. So, so it's very difficult to decide afterwards how much we can rely on this sort of material. Thank you so much for that. Now to numismatics, we're almost done and this is just the mm -hmm. fun stuff. So we yeah. get to talk about money. Money is always fun, right? Uh, in this image, if you see in the bottom left, kind of highlighted Muhammad's name in on this coin. Um, can you tell us what's said on these on these coins? And uh, I guess my question to be blunt is: Is it possible that the image we see on this coin is the Prophet himself? Uh, so not this one. You're perhaps thinking of the next one. So this is a Persian coin. No, oh, it's gone. Okay. Uh, yeah. So on the left, you have the Persian emperor. Very impressive. They're gorgeous crowns. Look at that winged crown. Absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And he's got lots of amazing um, like a necklace and you know, jewelry there. And then on the right is actually it's a really fascinating coin. This because it's originally this was a fire altar with two attendants. It probably still is, actually, but it gets repurposed in the Islamic period. But anyway, so, so this is a very 
classic Sasanian Persian coin. Yeah. It's been really, they've kept the same die, you know, the bit where you stamp the image on the coin, and they're just reusing it. But to make it clear that it's acceptable for Muslims and it's being issued by Muslims, they write in Arabic, Bismillah in the name of God, and then Muhammad Rasulullah, and that's around the edges, and that's just letting people know this is coming from the Muslim authorities. Because there's a double whammy to coins. I mean, um, the, the messages, they have an intrinsic meaning, but they're also letting you know this is acceptable, even if you can't read it. I mean, um, so in Britain, you know, you can read it's on the pound coin, they had it in Latin, but it, it's kind of got an air of authority about it. And it's what you expect. And so, you know, this is legitimate. Because you want to know if it's your money, you know, it's like someone gives me a $50 note. I want to know, is this, can I rely? Is, you know, I don't want to find out it's a fake. <laughs> no one will accept it. <laughs> so there's also the legitimate thing factor. So the Bismillah, Muhammad Rasulullah is letting people know, yep, this is coming from the conquerors. You can have faith in it. But it's fascinating because it's the first time Muhammad's name is appearing on an object at all. Oh, it wow. doesn't appear on any other inscription. So this is very striking. Um, you get references to Allah, God, but not actually to Muhammad before this. And it's coming out of the Second Civil War. The Muslims fight a lot of civil wars. <laughs> the second one starts around 683. And it's to do with succession, because the first of this family, Ma'awiyah, who belongs to an Umayyad family, he nominates his son. And so people are thinking, whoa, you know, I mean, that's still a bit of a no-no today, isn't it? You know, <laughs> this is always a bit worrying when people start nominating their son to take over. You think, uh oh, oh, is this family and say that, you know, we control everything and it's well, I'm just going to pass it through my family and my family's, you know, like an autocratic little unit. So as soon as that happens, people start getting, you know, worried and so it leads to the civil war with different factions on either side. And one of the rebel factions, they actually make a claim to saying that they fight for Muhammad, the prophet, and for his legacy. And they're saying actually his legacy is to be back in Medina, where the first caliphs were, not in Damascus. So they're arguing for a particular perspective on Islam, a certain type of Islam, which is much closer to Muhammad's legacy. And presumably they're in effectively attacking the Umayyads in Damascus as not having adhered to the Prophet's legacy of having departed from it and so being heretics. Hmm. So in this, it's a, it's always this wonderful thing about coins, there's like this tiny little object, but there's such an amazing backstory behind it. Yeah. And this is another one right here, right? So on the left, it mm. also looks once again, uh, like our previous image here in a sense, mm. right? The guy on the left, but on the right, it looks like a sheath sword warrior. Uh, what is this? What's what's going on with this one? The Vasidran of God, the representative. It's almost like a pope figure, or you know, something like that is mm. being written on here. What, what's tell yeah? Us about so I'd say it's a bit of a million dollar question you've got there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so yeah, this is also a Persian imitation of a Persian coin, and they've kept on the left side the figure of the emperor, but they've changed the image on the right side to include this figure bearing a sword. It's a fascinating figure because he's got this long hair coming down. Um, it, it tends to be taken as a caliph, representation of the caliph, right, the Muslim ruler. He's got Khalif Dullah next to him, which means, the yeah, vicegerent is one word, um, deputy really, but Khalifa, someone who's the representative of who stands in for, so Khalif Dullah. It's a very grand type of, I'm standing in for God, you know, <laughs> it's a hell of a yeah. claim to make, you know, so they're arguing that these Muslim rulers, caliphs are actually vicegerents of God, they stand in, they're the earthly rulers of the, you know, of the world who represent God, if you like. It's a claim to universal rule, a bit like the Mongols would make, that they were representing the sky God, you know, so they're gonna, act as the sole rulers for the whole world. But it's also been argued by uh, that this is not, this well, it could be Muhammad, it could be, there's also an argument for an apocalyptic Jesus, which is an interesting one. Jesus is sometimes portrayed in certain apocryphal Christian sources as coming with a sword, and mm -hmm. he's gonna separate out the believers from the unbelievers. Um, and so that's, 
another explanation. To, actually, it's, to me, it's quite an attractive one in a way. But it, it's, it's very difficult for an image. Images are things that are immediately relevant to people in the know. You know, it's like if you see logos of companies, you could just show like the Nike logo or something. You wouldn't <laughs> say anything. People know, aha, that's that. Yeah. But if you don't know, it's how would you ever know? Because it's a, it's a code. And it's the same with this. We don't really have the ability to decode it very easily. You get a number of, so there's a lot of these standing caliph coins. And some of them, especially those from northern Mesopotamia, what is now the very south of Turkey, particularly places like Edessa and Haran, and that they you have this image and then they write Muhammad above it. But does, is that Muhammad, is that just the local governor's name or is it actually referring to Muhammad the prophet? We don't really know. That's, That's why I ask. I ask because obviously people want to be cautious about what they say. Mm -hmm. They're, they're concerned. Like don't go around saying this is an image of the prophet. Cause especially mm -hmm. with, with cartoonists and stuff. I mean, in modern times, it's mm -hmm. obviously stirred up serious controversy. So I wondered if like scholarship would try to avoid this possible being the prophet, but it doesn't seem like that that's really the case. It sounds to me that like, no, they're just not sure. I mean, this could have been, mm. this could be, Yeah, you're not closed off to this being it possibly being him. No. And uh, so this is a kind of, it's a very modern fundamentalist idea that you shouldn't portray the prophet actually there's, um, but it was perfectly ordinary, especially in Persian miniature manuscripts. You get these really beautiful, images of different religious figures and it includes the prophet muhammad it was very ordinary there's nothing against it at all in in, in all parts of the middle east this is quite ordinary and it's I say it's a more fundamentalist uh, attitude but it, it's also unfortunately because the west when they introduce things like the muhammad cartoons they're not it's not just a, a neutral depiction yeah a western christian artist could do a painting of muhammad and it probably wouldn't cause any offense but obviously the cartoons were done in, in a mocking way and that's what obviously causes the extra offense. Right. Um, so it's partly the way it's done. But anyway, before the modern period, it certainly wasn't a problem to portray the prophet. I mean, there were still some certain fundamentalist groups who, uh, you know, who loved whacking anyone who played music or <laughs> you know, didn't go down the hills. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a trend. <laughs> you know, oh, I mean, wow. You have fundamentalist groups in all religions, it seems so. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pull up this final image and then I'm going to pull up two zoom in versions of it mm -hmm. so we can actually see it much clearer. I, I think these are beautiful mm -hmm. coins. So this image right here, the question is, mm -hmm. who is this guy right on this? I say guy because, look, th let's be mm -hmm. honest. If a woman grows a beard like that, I, I'd be I'd be really uh, <laughs> wanting some tips from her because she you know, yeah. anyway, we have this coin and I, I wanted to dichotomize it with a Christian one with Justinian the second above mm. uh, around the same period. Uh, you have this supposed standing standing caliph in 705 and Justinian the second. And the reason why I wanted to is that oftentimes and I could be wrong about this, this is why I kind of wanted to ask is, is that the coins. Let, let me put it this way. Whose name is on the coin? The, the one with the standing caliph, and maybe you can also elaborate on the one above. If it's Muhammad, is that the only name on the coin? Am I right in understanding that during the period that coins were minted, whenever there's an image of a person, the identity of that person is on the coin too? I understand that this is uh, this category falls into numismatics, but I suspect because you have looked at these things archaeologically and you've delved deep, is it possible that that makes more sense? Now, here's a mm -hmm. zoom in on the standing caliph. For everybody to see and then of course just standing in a second but which one would you want to pay attention to first uh so let's start with this one because we actually know much more about it the circumstances because we have written texts about it so actually it's a, a very good idea of yours to put the two there because it gives us again broader context because it isn't in isolation that the islamic coins appear um so this Justinianic coin is striking because the emperor who's normally at the front gets relegated to the rear and we have an image of Christ. It's a famous image, Pantocrator, um, in Christ as the world ruler. And this 
I think we know it's dated to about 692. There's, a, there's like a one or two year, 691, 692. It, there's also an internal debate within uh, Christian Rome, often gets called Byzantium, so I'll say Byzantium, which is about images. Is it okay to display images or not? And so presumably this is because they're on the back foot, the Roman Byzantine Empire, because of losing a lot of their provinces. And so they're thinking, have we done something wrong? And some people say, have we actually violated that most important of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not you know, make a graven image, you, know, you sh shouldn't make an image of God. So there's a big debate about this. And Justinian goes for a, nope, it's okay, I'm actually going to stick Jesus on the coin. <laughs> so it's very clear. So there's been an internal audience there. But there's, there must be something, I think, going on across, you know, not just within Byzantium, but from Byzantium to Islam. So this is, Jesus is our protector. Um, and uh, within a couple of years, anyway, you get the Muslim coin with that image uh, of the person with the long hair, as you say, beard, long robe, belt. It's beautifully done, absolutely beautiful craftsmanship. These are gold, actually, and then the sword. And the question is, what? So, a, a, it was seventy-five is way too late that you put. So, you put the death date of Abdul Malik himself, which is seven hundred five. But the coin must be much earlier than that. This one is actually quite an early one because on the rear, it's got this other mysterious <laughs> symbol, <laughs> which no one's quite sure what it is. And there's been loads of theories for. Because uh, late, what happens in a very quick space of time is that there are a number of different styles of coins issued by Abdul Malik. And the next one along just has writing on the rear. And then next one along again is writing on both sides only, just the Muslim profession of faith and um, other stuff about you know, where it was minted and so on. So they go to total. By the end of Abdul Malik's reign, they've gone to Words only, no images. Hmm. Push themselves sometimes. It's not one hundred percent clear. Um, but yes, who, who would they put on the coin? This is an interesting thing. So the Byzantines have put Jesus. What are you, as the Muslim ruler, going to? How are you going to respond? You could say you might think well, we'll we'll put our prophet on there. You know, Jesus is your prophet your top religious guy, we're going to put our top religious guy. So they stick Muhammad on there. Or, as some people have said, you, they put a different version of Jesus on there. So you have the one of Jesus with the uh, scripture. Um, and then this one is an apocalyptic Jesus where he's holding the sword, which will distinguish between the faithful and the uh, unbelievers. So, or you take the more prosaic one, and that tends to be what's won out because it's seen as a bit more neutral, and that is that it's simply the caliph. But it, we don't have uh, any documents to explain <laughs> this. So I'd say the, the other image, this funny thing on the steps, some people say that's a, a cross, a, a kind of truncated cross. It was a cross. What they've done is they've taken the, the crossbar out, and so that's a deliberate snub to the Christians. Some people say, but that's a negative image. Would they really put a negative image on there? Wouldn't they put a positive image? So surely this means something. Maybe it's, so the Muhammad is meant to have carried a staff, you know, a stick, a bit like, you know, Moses had his stick. But, um, and that's what it is. It refers to the prophet's staff. But to be, again, we, we just have no, con we have nothing to help us here understand this image. It's very difficult. So wow. it's, it's, it's good that you bring the Byzantine one there because you understand this is a, a kind of war of images going on. But there's probably an inter, in both cases, there's an internal war about the place of images. Um, and then in the Islamic case, they decide that images are bad, let's get rid of them. And they go for an, an iconic, for, in a very religious context. So like in a mosque, you could have images on three sides, but the side that faces Mecca, you can never have images. So in a very religious context, that's when you shouldn't have images. Islam's not against images by, you know, in total. It's just a very, in that religious context. So, and, but in the coins, they decide, let's just have words. So just cut out the images. So there was obviously some internal debate going on there. 
It's actually quite amazing because normally coins are conservative. You don't want to keep changing them because people are going to get worried. And is this legitimate? You know, this the image has changed like five times already now. So um, there's amazingly in ten years, there's all these different versions of the coins popping up. Wow. Um, and but we just don't know exactly what's behind it really. And I don't know. I'd invite readers to <laughs> just have a thing for themselves and read a bit, and then come up with ideas themselves on what lies behind that image. And say mainly the suggestions of Muhammad, an apocalyptic Jesus, or the ruler, the caliph. So people go for the ruler. It's a kind of safe option, I suppose. And it's kind of what you expect, I suppose. In general, rulers appeared on coins, so there people are assuming that they just kept. They just did. Initially, the Muslims thought, well, I'll do this. we'll do the same as the Romans and we'll put the image of our ruler. But it's still very striking because you do get statues of the caliphs at their palaces. For example, the palace in Jericho, Khalifat al Mafcha, beautiful palace. And they have an uh, image of the caliph, but he actually his hair is rather nicely permed. Actually. So hmm. it's interesting, it's very long hair. And often that does have religious significance. Um, wow. Relig- religious figures often, you know, because you don't like perming your hair or treating it is a, is a sign of your attachment to this world. So if you don't care about the world, then you let your hair go, let your hair and beard go and don't worry about it. Um, but it's fascinating. It's a beautiful robe, actually, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, viewers, I'm leaning forward because I'm trying to look <laughs> at the image more. But it's a beautifully done image. Some people have even suggested it's not actually a sword that he's holding but a scroll in a, a protecting sheath and that it refers to the fact that Muhammad is meant to have given a scroll to Ali his son, son-in-law with kind of special information about the secrets of Islam so yeah if you're looking at myths and kind of <laughs> secrets <laughs> this is a fantastic place to start and it's difficult for us because it's before the kind of more official Islam, where we have lots of documentation, you know, we don't have documentation much for what Muslims are thinking in this period. And this is the difficult bit, what the, what was the ideological thinking of the internal, you know, of the community itself. We don't really have access to that. So these images are fantastic, but an image on its own is is difficult to decode without external information. I absolutely love your explanation. I just did a video Uh, Because I was listening to Muslim apologists and then people who are like antagonists go at arguing about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got the connection to like countless experts when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, Dr. Bart Ehrman, how you doing? I got a question for you (laughs) Mm -hmm. because he's doing a Mm -hmm. seminar recently, a Mm -hmm. webinar. And I said, uh, Mm -hmm. like, how do the Muslims get Jesus historically Jesus wrong? And he's like, well, Mm -hmm. You know, because I said, look, we've already done how Christians may have get it, get it wrong, but their version. And I had this question I asked him toward the end. He thought it was an interesting question. He never really thought about it. But um, Reza Aslan, who wrote the book Zealot about Jesus, mm-hmm. I asked him, is it possible? Do you do you think that like the reason he wrote that book Zealot may stem from coming from the Islamic approach and seeing Jesus mm-hmm. more of a militant zealot matches more in line with the Mm. conquest of his prophet and he said i never thought about it that way that's interesting but he said Mm. i don't think so he thinks that rez is going in line with the rest of some of the historians that or scholars on Mm. jesus studies who have actually come to this conclusion they thought when you look at the book of acts you see you know these certain rebel figures who get stamped out and their movement mm. goes extinct. But, you know, they mm. even have a famous uh, Jewish teacher who's like, no, man, don't fight against them. You might find yourself fighting against God. And, of course, mm. this seems to be also a myth. But either way, it's interesting that, um, that that some have come to that conclusion. So I thought maybe they're painting – maybe he wants Jesus to be a rebel figure. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. It's just my thinking. No, it's a good idea. I mean, he might. Uh, try, when did he write it? Do you know the book? Because if it's post nine eleven, then there was a number of figures who wanted to try and show that hey, you know, Christianity likes to think of itself as a religion of peace and Islam as a religion of war. But actually, you know, Christianity also has its fair share of war and fighting, which is of course true. <laughs> so if he was writing post nine eleven, then you could imagine. Yeah, two thousand and thirteen. Yeah, you can imagine Reza wanting to show, hey, you know, 
It may even be that Jesus himself is a jihadi, you know, yeah. <laughs> to put it in the actual real terminology that he's thinking of. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, man, this has been an absolute blast. Everybody go to Amazon. I held them longer than I thought I was going to have them. Uh, we have much more to discuss. I just need to read through this whole book, Arabia and the Arabs, and get deeper into some of these discussions. But I would absolutely uh, recommend you guys read the books. Please do. In fact, it makes the scholars who do come on recognize that it's worth their time and time is energy. And of course, I see it as very valuable to come on and have these discussions with you to educate the general public. And um, these questions that we asked today were mostly from people who are patrons of Myth Vision. Consider becoming one. Uh, th this is how I do what I do uh, constantly to educate more people. And I thank you for everybody who's helped support me. Uh, Dr. Hoyland, if, if I could... I want to give you an opportunity. Are you working on anything? Is there anything in particular you would really recommend everybody to check out or get a certain book or anything in, in particular? Um, so I'm actually uh, starting work on some ex different excavations at the moment. So I'm going in a slightly different direction for or my core research at the moment. Although I've also been publishing some of these texts, which actually when I wrote my first book, <laughs> Islam in the 1990s, were unpublished then. And they're still unpublished now, so I'm kind of publishing these, so just to make them much more accessible to a broader audience. For a broader thinking about that is that um, there's a couple of nice books through Islam. It's sadly you, wrote it just to you see broke up a second. You said for broader disease. For broader thinking, go ahead. Yeah, it's a good so just broader thinking about um, what is Islam, and that's the title of the book. What does it mean both to Muslims and how is it viewed by others? And it's an internal view of a educated Muslim just thinking about his own civilization. Um, and it's a, a kind of very thoughtful read for... We all, in the post-9-11 world, people have very distinct ideas about Islam, which is often not at all true. He starts off with one unbelievably strong stereotype, which is when he's sitting drinking a glass of wine somewhere and someone just comes up to him and says, but you're a Muslim, you shouldn't be drinking. And um, it's funny, we kind of, a lot of non-Muslims have the idea that Muslims should stick to their religion. I mean, in theory, Christians shouldn't be having sex before marriage, but you, God, you wouldn't get, get through the day if you had to point out to everyone who Christian who has sex before marriage that they shouldn't be doing so. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So, yes, of course, there's laws, but it doesn't mean we all follow them. You know? <laughs> but somehow people think Muslims should follow the law. <laughs> and just drinking is probably the biggest one. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. he um, goes through what it means to be a Muslim, which doesn't necessarily mean following the letter of the law, but it, it's broad. He thinks of it as a broader cultural civilization. Yeah. Wow. There's so much to learn from you on this subject. I really do appreciate it. I hope that we can do this again. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we'll take questions at, from people who are wanting to help uh, the channel out and they want to steer the content. They're more than welcome to ask questions from experts. Thank you once again for joining me, Dr. Hoyland. And mm -hmm. I am going to get all of your books. And at some point, I'll have mm -hmm. all of them read. And mm -hmm. we will hopefully connect again, maybe actually meet in person someday. And I can interview mm -hmm. you, get some wonderful content, and uh, work it out from there. So thank you. That would be great. It's been really nice talking to you, Derek. Thanks for the opportunity. You too. Don't go anywhere yet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're lost, you don't know your way, I've got a chant for you. We are... Myth Vision.